Hello and welcome to your lecture. In this video, we're going to go through the peripheral nervous system. So this is coming from Pearson um, textbook, the 11th edition. We're going to be focusing on the general structure of a nerve. We're going to define ganglion and indicate the general locations of the ganglia. And we'll be describing the general structure of a spinal nerve and the general distribution of its rami. If you think about the peripheral nervous system in contrast to the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system is the part of the nervous system that's really in touch with the environment, whether that is your internal environment or the external environment. We understand that it is constructed of everything outside of the brain and the spinal cord. And we can break it down into four parts sensory receptors, nerves and their structure, motor activity and reflex activity. So we saw this picture in previous lectures when we were talking about the nervous system at large. So with the brain and the spine set aside, we are diving into the PNS. Remember we have a sensory or afferent division which brings information from the environment and directs it toward the central nervous system. It also has a motor efferent division. That is the part of the peripheral nervous system that will send directions or ac activity or actions out to the body. When we get into that motor efferent division, that then is broken into the somatic nervous system and autonomic. Remember that the autonomic nervous system is of the motor division of the PNS and we break it into sympathetic and parasympathetic. And remember, sympathetic nervous system is primarily in charge for fight or flight responses, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is in charge of whining, wine and dine responses or rest and digest. So sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. So sensory receptors, these are specialized parts of a neuron that uh, they are specialized to respond to some type of stimuli. And depending on the construct of a particular receptor, will deliver its ability to receive the information. For example, not all nerves feel pain. Those are called nociceptors, so, or primarily nociceptors. So when we think about a sensory nerve, we break that down into a bunch of other parts. So when a sensory receptor gets stimulated, it will uh, activate action potentials that trigger or, or allow a nerve to fire. In this category of sensory receptors, we have mechanoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are going to respond to touch, just to know something is touching us. Pressure, vibration, and stretch. A thermoreceptor will be sensitive to changes in temperature. When we have photoreceptors, these are sensory receptors that will respond to light. We'll find that that's a, the retina, for example. A chemoreceptor is a type of receptor that will receive information about chemicals. So smell, taste, we have these in various points of our cardiovascular system. Here's the nociceptor category that I mentioned. These are sensitive to pain causing stimuli, which could be extreme heat or cold, excessive pressure, and a chemical that is pro-inflammatory. If something is pro-inflammatory, it has inspired an immune response. 
proprioceptors then, they respond to stretch in skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments. So the way that we classify nerves, we touched on this already, but we're going to go into it a little better. Remember that a nerve is a cord-like organ. It's a bundle of axons enclosed by connective tissue. Most nerves within the PNS will be a mixture of both afferents, bringing information into the central nervous system and efferent fibers, giving direction and somatic and visceral. So one nerve can receive information or one bundle of axons can receive information, can send out information. It might go to the body wall or it might go to the viscera and the organs. Nerves are classified according to the direction that they transmit the impulse. So for example, sensory afferent, bringing it in the up elevator, taking it to the central nervous system, Motor efferent takes it away and out to the body for direction, telling it what to do. If it's a mixed nerve, that tells us it's a combination of both. <clears throat> when we refer to something that is somatic, this is um, something that will go, um, for example, if it's a somatic afferent, it will be sensory from muscle to brain because it's sensory, it's pulling information in. If it's somatic efferent, that tells us that it's taking direction out to a muscle. So somatic tells us um, it has something to do with body wall stuff. If we're talking visceral, it's the opposite. It's organ systems. It's more internal and a visceral nerve can be either afferent or efferent. When we're talking the connective tissue around a nerve, this is, again, we have if you look at this picture, this does a really great job of pulling this apart so we understand the construct. Here is one axon on this picture wrapped in a myelin sheath. Remember, it's in the peripheral nervous system. The myelin sheath will be created by Schwann cells. There will be multiple axons, or let's back the train up. One axon then and its myelin sheath will be covered with what we will call endoneurium. That would be the most inner wrapping paper around an axon. This is loose connective tissue that will wrap around the axons and the sheath. And there will be multiple axons wrapped in endoneurium inside of a perineurium. This is coarse connective tissue that will bundle a um, multitude of fibers into what we call a fascicle. So perineurium wraps around bun a bunch of axons into a group called a fascicle. Epineurium, this is tough fibrous sheath around a bunch of fascicles. And that entire thing forms the nerve. Within the nerve or within the construct of all of this, we will have some blood supply. When we talk about ganglia, we've mentioned ganglia already, uh, and I think we've seen pictures of them, whether lecture or lab. The ganglia will contain neuron cell bodies that are associated with nerves in the peripheral nervous system. And usually there's, a, it's a meeting point where we can have synapses. So the ganglia associated with afferent nerve fibers contain cell bodies of sensory neurons. Hope that makes sense because it's afferent pulling information in. The dorsal root ganglia, which is coming out of the back side, the dorsal side of the spinal cord, the dorsal root ganglia, this is sensory somatic. So it's pulling in information from the body wall. Ganglia that are associated with efferent nerve fibers will contain autonomic motor neurons. This is 
autonomic ganglia. So they are motor and they are visceral. So we're going to see this on the other side. And our picture here demonstrates that very well. We can see our spinal cord, uh, the posterior aspect. We will see the uh, spinous process of the vertebra sticking out the back. The dorsal root ganglion, again, will be sensory and somatic. So it's bringing information into the spinal cord from the body, wall, muscles, bones, and joints of the back and around the rib cage, maybe part of that information coming in there. We can see the dorsal root and we can see the ventral root here as well. When we talk spinal nerves, then there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. All are mixed and they're named for the point of issue from the spinal cord. So for example, remember that we have seven cervical vertebra, but we will have eight cervical nerves because of how they exit. There will be a nerve root exiting between C0 and C1. C0 is the occiput. And the C8 nerve root is actually the nerve root that will exit below your seventh cervical vertebra. Now within the cervical region, we have an area where the spinal cord itself gets a little bit larger because there is a lot of information coming in here. This is called the cervical enlargement. We have one in the lumbar region as well called the lumbar enlargement. And then, um, yeah, we'll stop there. That's all I'll mention there. We also have areas called plexi or plexuses. We have a cervical plexus, a brachial plexus, a lumbar plexus, a sacral plexus. Now I mentioned that we have something within the spinal cord called the uh, cauda equina. That is, it's gonna look like a horse tail. And this is actually after the end of the spinal cord. The spinal cord will end about L1, lumbar vertebra number one. So back to the spinal nerves that are mixed. Remember, um, there are 31 pairs. There will be eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one pair of tiny coccygeal nerves. So when we're looking at these nerve roots, each spinal nerve is connected to the spinal cord via two roots. So let's, let's start looking at what we call a nerve and what we call a root. So a ventral root will contain the motor efferent fibers that will come out of the ventral horn of motor neurons that innervate skeletal muscles. So if you look here at the picture, you can see on the ventral or anterior side of the spinal cord, we have these little finger like projections that will attach. This is the ventral root. If you look at the posterior aspect of the spinal cord coming off in the area where we will have the dorsal horn of the spinal cord noted, we will have those little finger like projections and that is a dorsal root. They will merge to form the uh, dorsal root ganglion. We can see here, um, we have ganglion of the sympathetic uh, nervous system or the sympathetic trunk ganglion running alongside the more ventral portion of the spinal cord. The dorsal roots will contain sensory. So that's important. In the posterior portion of the spinal cord, this is where the information from stimulus will come in for its integration. It will be synapsed within the spinal cord or maybe sent up 
uh, one of the up elevators to a higher brain center for interpretation. When messages come back down, they're going to be sent out the ventral route, uh, generally delivering motor function and direction. Now, after we see the dorsal root and the ganglion, the spinal nerve is what um, is formed after that point. From there, we will see what is called the ventral ramus. It's gonna wrap to the ventral side of the body or, or the dorsal ramus will come off of the spinal cord. Then we also have something called rami communicantes. This will be a connection point between that ventral ramus in this case, what we're looking at, and the sympathetic trunk ganglion. Both ventral and dorsal roots are branched medially as rootlets. They will join laterally to form spinal nerves. Again, remember that carries mixed signals, both motory and sensory. It's not until they come to this junction point where their information can be directed differently. Spinal nerves, what we would call a spinal nerve is only about one to two centimeters long. Almost immediately after exiting a foramen, spinal nerves will divide into their three branches. We saw the dorsal ramus, the ventral ramus, and we do have a meningeal branch that we didn't see on the other picture. This branch re-enters the vertebral canal to innervate meninges and blood vessels. The spinal nerve rami and their main branches will supply the entire somatic region of the body from the neck down. The dorsal rami supply the back side of the body. The ventral rami supply the rest of the trunk and the limbs. So the difference between roots and rami, the roots lie medial to and form spinal nerves. Each root is purely sensory or motor. The rami lie distal to and are lateral branches of the spinal nerves. And these guys will carry both sensory and motor information. That's a nice little um, slide to help with the differences. All ventral rami except T2 through T12 form interlacing nerve networks called nerve plexuses. These are found in the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral areas, like I mentioned, and only ventral rami will form the plexuses. Within a plexus, the fibers crisscross. So each branch will contain fibers from several different spinal nerves, which is interesting. And the fibers from the ventral ramus will go to the body periphery via several roots. This means each limb muscle is innervated by more than one spinal nerve. So damage to one does not cause paralysis, which is really smart. So within the cervical plexus, C1 through C4, this is what will form that plexus it will form cutaneous nerves. These guys will innervate the skin of the neck, the back of the head and the shoulders and other branches that will innervate the neck muscles. So we can see here, we're looking at ventral rami, we're looking at nerve roots formed or from nerve roots formed. We see here its relationship to the hypoglossal nerve we see the accessory nerve, cranial nerve 11. Here we have the phrenic nerve. This one's really important. Phrenic nerve will lead to the diaphragm. If this guy gets cut, you can't breathe. So the phrenic nerve is contributed to by supplies, C4, C3, 
C2, maybe a little bit of C1. So a little bit of everything, which makes super sense. So the phrenic nerve, major motory and sensory nerve of the diaphragm, major muscles for breathing. The phrenic nerve receives its primary fibers from C3 through C5. The irritation of the phrenic nerve can cause spasms spasms of our diaphragm. These are hiccups. So if both phrenic nerves are severed or if C3 through C5 region of the spinal cord is compressed, you can paralyze your diaphragm. If it's destroyed, it can be paralyzed. If it's, if you have compression there, you might have difficulty breathing. The brachial plexus, this is formed from the ventral rami of C5 through C8 and T1, often C4 and or T2. So there are variations. We're gonna find that across the board. I think we've learned that. It will give rise to nerves that innervate your upper limb. So this is the axillary nerve, which will innervate the deltoid and the teres minor and parts of the shoulder. The musculocutaneous innervates biceps, the brachialis, coracobrachialis, and skin of the lateral forearm. The brachial plexus will form the median nerve to innervate the skin, forearm pronators, wrist and finger flexors, as well as thumb muscles. The ulnar nerve will supply flexor carpi ulnaris, intrinsic hand muscles, skin and medial aspect of the hands, wrist and finger flexion. The radial nerve, almost all extensor muscle supinators and posterior skin of the uh, limb. If, uh, in regards to the median nerve, injury makes it difficult to use or pinch or grasp. We see this in carpal tunnel syndrome where the median nerve is compressed. The ulnar nerve, when it is damaged, you can uh, lose sensory perception. You can have paralysis and muscle atrophy. You would have trouble making a fist. The little finger and the ring finger might become hyperextended at the knuckles and flexed at the distal interphalangeal joints. This could create a claw hand. When we hit our funny bones, this is what we're feeling. Um, this is where the med the ulnar nerve rests against the medial epicondyle and it will run down that pinky side. It's on the ulnar side. If we have radial nerve injury, we'll, we might get what's called wrist drop, the inability to extend the hand at the wrist. Now, when we get to the lumbar plexus, this is from L1 to L4. It innervates the thigh and abdominal wall. The femoral nerve will innervate the quadriceps and skin of the anterior thigh and medial leg. The obturator nerve will pass through the obturator foramen to innervate the adductor thigh muscle group. When we get to the sacral plexus, this is L4 to S4 nerves will serve the buttock, the lower limb, the pelvic structure, and the perineum. The sciatic nerve is part of this, begins to exit at L4. It's the longest and thickest nerve of the body. It can be palpated from the posterior aspect of the thigh if you dig your hands in the, your hamstring muscle. It will innervate the hamstring and most of the muscles in the leg and foot. So it's composed of both the tibial portion and a common fibular. So if you look at where these guys lie, here comes our sciatic nerve. It's the big thick one. It will branch off down into the lower part of the, part of the leg. The tibial portion runs right down the back side of your calf. The common fibular will run along that outside of the leg as well. Now, cranial nerves, we went over these in our previous lecture. We'll hit them again. The brain must communicate with the rest of the body. 
Most of the input and output will travel by way of the spinal cord. The 12 pairs of cranial nerves, we know that they come from the base of the brain. They exit the cranium through foramina somewhere. They will mostly lead to um, structures in the head and neck, except for the vagus nerve, like we learned. Most cranial nerves will carry fibers between the brain stem and ipsilateral receptors and effectors. So we saw this in our other lecture, but I'll review it. Remember we have sensory cranial nerves. We have three sensory, one, two, and eight. Motor, we have five of them, three, four, six, 11, and 12. And our mixed cranial nerves are five, seven, nine, and 10. So to review cranial nerves again, uh, cranial nerve one is our olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve two is optic. Cranial nerve three, oculomotor. Cranial nerve four is trochlear. Cranial nerve five and your largest one is the trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve six is the abducens nerve. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. Cranial nerve eight is vestibulocochlear nerve. Cranial nerve nine is glossopharyngeal. Cranial nerve 10 is vagus. Cranial nerve 11 is hypoglossal. Uh, I'm sorry, 12 is hypoglossal. And uh, cranial nerve 11 is the accessory nerve. Sorry, it's where they come out a little bit differently. That needs noted. Um, if you need an acronym, um, there are some on YouTube. I will try to post uh, ones that I find that I think will be helpful if I find a good one. Okay, um, in our last lecture, we reviewed all of the cranial nerves. So I'm not gonna redo that. It is in your lecture uh, notes from last time, but let's move on into reflexes. Reflexes are automatic responses to sensory input. So these are more these are reactions. These are not responses. They don't require, nor should they require a thought. So there are four important properties of reflex. It will require stimulation. It's not a spontaneous action, but it's a response to something. Reflexes have to be quick. They involve few neurons and minimum synaptic delay. One thing we learned is that the synapse and the interneuron or association neuron delivers the ability to think, process, and choose. When we're operating a reflex, we don't want that to happen. Reflexes are a response that your body will have that's involuntary. They are stereotyped, which means they occur essentially the same way every time because they're following a pathway. So we have two different types. They're classified functionally. A somatic reflex activates skeletal muscle. This helps us assess the nervous system. We do this when we get our patellar tendons hit with a reflex hammer. That's what we're looking for. We're making sure that reflex arc is operating appropriately between the two sides. It can in indicate degeneration or pathology of something. If it's exaggerated, if it's distorted, if it's not present at all, in, and really, if it's different from side to side. An, autom an autonomic or visceral reflex, I think these are way neat and we don't talk about them a lot or, or we're not aware of them a lot. These guys will activate visceral effectors of smoother cardiac muscles or glands. So glandular secretions of the digestive tract is an example. This is an automatic response. It's, there's a stimuli that comes in, or maybe you're thinking about food and your digestive system, your mouth starts to water. The components of a reflex arc, they must have a receptor, something to receive the information. They have uh, so a sensory neuron that transmits afferent impulses to the CNS, an integration center within the central nervous system connected by an interneuron with a fast response, a motor neuron that will take the correspondent action back out and, uh, and something that it's having move and uh, the effector, the muscle or gland that's 
going to be responding. So here in essence, in this picture is a pretty easy way to understand it. So in this picture, the stimulus, the site we can see is the skin. We have a sensory neuron here. We step on a nail or something. This neuron will detect damaged tissue likely by chemistry, pressure, maybe pain. It will sense this. It will pull it into the spinal cord where the interneuron may be located. It's not going far. It's a short distance. It will then synapse with a motor neuron, linking it to a muscle that needs moved. So we can pull the foot off of the tack or do whatever we need to do. So if a primary motor cortex or a corticospinal tract gets damaged, there is a plantar reflex that is replaced by an abnormal reflex and it's called Babinski's sign. It's when the, the, your big toe dorsiflexes and the smaller one will fan laterally if you know, you're given a stimulus. So infants exhibit Babinski's sign until they're about a year old because the nervous system isn't totally myelinated. Uh, if this happens in an adult, it's uh, aberrant. 